Thank you very much uh, for having me, and thank you for coming. Um, I promise I won't go through 600 slides. You'll, you'll be here till midnight. So what I intend to do is go through a few slides from each chapter, and I think that will give you a feel as we walk back in time uh, and really see the uh, tremendously rich history of the island. Because not only the, the prehistory, but uh, the history of the island is connected with our regional history, California history, American history, and much more than that on another level, the story of the island is about people. And this goes back some 13,000 years ago when the first humans uh, settled on the North America continent and the Channel Islands. And all of these people over thousands of years had a common bond. They endured the hardships of the island and they enjoyed the beauty of the island. So lights down, dim, where'd she go? There we go. As you know, uh, Santa Cruz Island and four other of the Channel Islands are part of Channel Islands National Park, which was created in uh, 1980. Um, and you see the smallest of the island is um, Santa Barbara Island, and which is about 600 acres and is uh, really on top of a large underwater ridge that extends all the way to the back of the largest island, which is uh, Santa Cruz. This is, this is a picture of uh, in the springtime after some rains um, of the top of the field above Scorpion Canyon. And you see Anacapa, uh, the volcanic uh, island of uh, uh, Anacapa in the background. And uh, this demonstrates some of the beauty of the island and all over the island, there's uh, places of equal or even more beauty. And, but this all masks the violent uh, birth of the island. And here you can see, I like this view of the island because I think it gives you a good perspective. The island is 23 and a half miles long. 60, uh, 62,000 acres, and, and if you were to sail around the island, uh, you would have gone uh, probably about 77 miles. And the island, as you can see, uh, is more adept, adept to uh, sheep ranching than cattle because it's way too rugged for cattle. Out of 62,000 acres, there's only about 8,000 acres of good pasture land, and it takes at least uh, 10 acres uh, of good pasture land to raise one head of cattle. Uh, you see here the Santa Cruz Island Fault, and that uh, exemplifies the fact that the Santa Cruz Island is really two land masses that were formed millions of uh, years ago at different locations and at different times, and at one point uh, uh, merged together. The south side of the island, uh, roughly about 56% of the island, is of sedimentary type soils. And the dramatic difference is when you go over to the other side of the island, you see uh, volcanic cliffs and volcanic uh, caves. Now, what, what is all, how, what's all happening here is millions of years ago, 
probably starting around 27 million years ago. And uh, the Pacific plate is uh, spreading, colliding, and grinding against the North American plate and is carving out the portion of land, Western Traverse Range, Channel Island blank, uh, block, and rotated it, moved it up the coast, and that really is a portion of the south side of the island. And while this is taking place about 17 million years ago with the Pacific plates uh, expanding and cracking, uh, there was a lot of volcanic activity in the Southern California area, and that is the basis, the origin of the northern portion of the island. Now here's smugglers on the backside, and you can see the transition of the volcanic rocks right here, transitioning into sedimentary type soils, and these soils would continue for another um, 23 miles down the backside of the island. This is what you'll see on the north uh, side of the island. This is the side of the island that <clears throat> uh, faces uh, the California coast. And there are 100 sea caves, and that gives you uh, some indication of the violent nature of the island's birth. Now, this is a postcard around 1900, and uh, people have been talking about Painted Cave, which is on the um, west end of the island on the north side. It's a, reputed to be the largest sea cave in the world. The, the height there is about 160 feet. It goes back 1,200 feet into the island. And uh, if you've ever been back there on a little raft or kayak, um, there's a little beach and you'll be greeted by sea lions and uh, they will be giving their opinion of the intrusion. One feels that he's entering into a vast temple dedicated perhaps to Neptune. That's how Scientific America wrote about um, uh, Painted Cave in uh, 1897. And then there you can see why they thought uh, it was a temple and the, the different chambers, the brilliant colors, and it's truly spectacular. Fast forwarding about uh, millions of years to about you know, 18,000 years ago, um, during the last ice age, the entire configuration of the channel, Santa Barbara Channel was much different. The sea levels were uh, 400 feet lower, at least 400 feet lower. And you can see that this massive land island uh, called Santa Rosa uh, stretched about 77 miles. So the difference between that land mass and the coast varied four or five uh, miles. And so you can get a vision of how early human beings, uh, birds, mammals uh, made their way uh, uh, to the island. And global warming started probably around uh, 15,000 years ago. And it can, has continued to this day. Um, you, by 10,000 years uh, ago, uh, the islands uh, retained their independence uh, that we uh, know today. In 1959, uh, Phil Orr, who was an anthropologist for uh, the Museum of Natural History, uh, I met Phil when he was much older and much more cranky, uh, but, he, but he discovered uh, human remains on what is now known as Arlington Springs and Santa Rosa Island, uh, human remains, and he had them uh, carbon dated and uh, the date that came back was 13,000 years ago, which is concrete proof that uh, humans on the Channel Islands are some of the oldest, if not the oldest, humans uh, in North America. Now you see the little uh, huts, um, hemispherical, those are houses that Chumash regularly had, uh, both on the island and the the mainland, they had an opening at the top 
uh, and some of the larger uh, uh, houses could, if you can believe, house as many as 50 people. They had Thule mats to partition uh, the different uh, families or people in the, in the hut. Um, and of course, this is uh, the Tomo that uh, you're well familiar with. So probably at the height of uh, the Chumash population, and when I speak of Chumash, that's uh, really a later term, uh, the Chumash and their ancestors been on the island for the 13,000 years. But <clears throat> during the period of 1772 to 1834, which is considered the mission period, um, there were probably about 140 different sites from San Luis Obispo to um, uh, Santa Monica Mountains. And on the Channel Islands, there were known to be uh, 21 sites, 11 of which were uh, on Santa Cruz. Now bear in mind that there is still more studies to be done, surveys to be done, uh, because it's believed that uh, right around where the ocean level was 400 feet less, uh, lower than it is today, there's probably more uh, uh, sites. About 2,000 years ago, uh, the Chumash and their ancestors uh, uh, designed, engineered, and built uh, the Tomo. This was a plank canoe. This was a first uh, in North America. Before that, they would take a log and uh, they call them dugout logs. Um, they'd use those for small boats or Thule uh, boats that were easy to put together. But the um, uh, Tomo was a major, major project. And you can see the seams there. They would uh, take the um, craft the, the sides of it, the timbers, they would um, put it in hot water, bend it to uh, have it fit the flooring, and then they would caulk it with asphaltum and whatever other mix the, the Indians put in it. And then you can see the seams. They would drill holes on each side of the seams and uh, bind it together. So it was uh, waterproof to some extent. Uh, they had a, usually had a little boy bailing uh, water. Uh, interesting enough, they used rocks for ballast, so they understood the concept of ballast, and that's what we used on our boats. So, so it was quite a feat, uh, and the large, probably the largest uh, Tomo they built was probably 30 feet long, uh, could hold as many as two tons of weight and the smaller ones might be eight to 10 feet. Um, and that gave um, the Indians uh, much more flexibility and maneuverability to come to the coast. And, and about the same time, they developed uh, bead money. And here you see um, the little uh, beads uh, uh, that they produced pretty exclusively on Santa Cruz Island because Santa Cruz Island had uh, a lot of outcroppings of chert, and you break that and it breaks off into uh, very sharp pieces that they use for micro drills and also scrapers and knives. And then they made um, uh, the bracelets and those were highly um, sought after. And so they developed this trade between uh, the mainland and the island, uh, the island Indians uh, exporting uh, marine uh, goods in addition to the beads and the mainland Indians would send out bows, uh, bow and arrows, asphaltum and other things that the island Indians need. Now this gives you an idea that, uh, imagine that uh, these folks had to survive every single day. There were no Walmarts, there were no uh, supermarkets or anything. So they were out among the islands fishing uh, every day and they developed their own equipment. Uh, you can see here, uh, one of them is going to harpoon and they developed the two-pronged harpoon so that they can go after uh, small and uh, big fish. And the Indians, uh, when the Spanish uh, arrived, were known to be very friendly. 
Uh, unfortunately, that happened to be their downfall because they were didn't have immunity to uh, many of the diseases that the Spaniards uh, and other white people uh, brought to the area. And this was a situation that w was replicated in the, uh, the Southwest, the West, where sometimes entire tribes uh, were wiped out uh, by diphtheria, uh, typhoid, and, and other diseases. <clears throat> Fernando Labrado is important because both his parents were born and lived on, uh, on Santa Cruz Island and were baptized on Santa Cruz Island. And he's also uh, important because he had a wealth of information of the folklore and the customs of the island Indians. And somehow he uh, obtained a lot of knowledge about how the Tomo was built. And uh, the Indians didn't allow everybody to uh, stand around and watch how this uh, boat was uh, being built. Uh, they were very selective in who got to experience uh, the construction of it. But Fernando obviously uh, got a lot of information and he gave a lot of oral interviews to John Harrington, who then put it in the books and it's really the basis of a lot of our knowledge of the Chumash culture and how they uh, uh, constructed um, their uh, their tomos. You can see this is a map in 1787, very rough of California. Not too many people knew much about uh, California, although the uh, the British and the Russians were sniffing around. And uh, between uh, 1769 and 1848 three different countries, uh, Spain, Mexico, and the United States, would claim ownership to California and uh, the Channel Islands. Um, Spain uh, preempted the situation by uh, launching their, what is called the Portola Expedition, uh, 1769, and uh, Spain is credit, uh, credited uh, with naming uh, Santa Cruz Island, Isla de la Santa Cruz, uh, and it was named that because when their ship, the San Antonio, was there at Prisoner's Harbor in 1769, the Indians uh, brought back to the ship uh, a lost missionary staff that had a metal cross on it. So the Spaniards named the island, Island de la Santa Cruz. Uh, Mexico took over, declared its independence uh, from Spain, 1821, and uh, two things that Mexico uh, uh, did. Uh, one, they never occupied Santa Cruz, but they thought it might be a good place to uh, uh, deposit some unsavory prisoners uh, that they deported out of uh, uh, Mexico. Neither San Diego or Santa Barbara wanted them, so they dumped them over in the area of Prisoner's Harbor, and that's where the history stops. Nobody knows what happened after that, but you could suspect uh, they didn't get where they were by uh, being shy about uh, hijacking passing boats or whatever. So, uh, but anyway, that's the name, the reason that Prisoner's Harbor is named. More significantly, um, Spain, you can see the, the vast territory up here, and Spain wanted to settle and control that area. And the way they did it, is they created or um, gave uh, about 500 land grants, uh, probably over several million acres, and they gave it to Mexican citizens who uh, gave service to the Mexican government. And in 1839, uh, they gave uh, Captain Andres Castellero uh, a choice. Do you want Santa uh, Catalina or do you want Santa Cruz? Well, he first chose Catalina, and then somebody said, dummy, there's no water in Catalina. Santa Cruz is a better, uh, better island, and he chose Santa Cruz. So um, the governor Alvarado signed that um, uh, grant grant B to him, uh, land grant in 1839, and he became the first uh, private owner of Santa Cruz Island. Now the next slide is is a little bit of history, but I think it's. Uh, 
important because uh, the United States uh, acquires uh, California and a lot of other land uh, in 1848 and through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And that settled a two-year war with Mexico over a border dispute. But uh, kids don't uh, grow up knowing too much about it. It was, it was a real war. There were 40,000 casualties in that war and many of the uh, uh, officers uh, in that Mexican war uh, uh, eventually fought in the Civil War against one another, like uh, Grant and Lee and, and Armistead. But anyway, uh, they both countries wanted to settle. It was an unpopular war. And the United States pays Mexico uh, $15 million and assumes another $3 million in claims. And in exchange, uh, the United States receives 525,000 square miles, and imagine. I mean, it, it was a huge chunk of land that included uh, eight, uh, or part of eight uh, existing states today, including Texas and California. Um, it's important to know that uh, the treaty was actually signed 10 days after the discovery of gold. And nobody knew about it. There's no Facebook. There was no texting. And, um, and matter of fact, there was a lot of skepticism after um, uh, the gold was discovered. They, you know, well, they're, ju they're just blowing hot air. And so finally, the word finally got back to back east and across the, uh, the Atlantic that Indeed, uh, gold was, uh, this is a real discovery. People were making millions uh, of dollars. And so, hence, uh, 1849, the 49ers, tens of thousands of people came to uh, California, and uh, they didn't give a squat about uh, Mexican land grants or uh, Mexican citizens' rights. They just squatted and Congress realized it had a real problem on its hand and was going to lead to a civil war unless something could be done. So 1851, Congress, if you can imagine, passed a law that was only five pages long and really defined title in California uh, all the way to the present. And um, uh, it was very simple. They formed a commission, and if you had any claim to real estate, uh, you had to file your claim and, and prove it. And if you didn't file within that two-year period uh, or didn't present sufficient evidence, it, the land remained in the public domain. In other words, it belonged to the United States. And just as an aside, the United States government owns 45% of California. <clears throat> so Castellero, uh dutifully went through this entire process and he filed a claim in, I think, 1852. Uh, the United States government opposed him every inch of the way and uh, they weren't thinking about a national park then, but they uh, opposed him and uh, Cashelera won. And finally the case went to the United States Supreme Court in 1860 and they ruled in Castellero's uh, favor. Now this just uh, this is one of the maps uh, called the Disternal Map that uh, was attached to the Treaty of Guadalupe uh, Hidalgo. It just shows you the vast area that the United States uh, received. And, and you think, well, the United States got a great bargain, but it was, it was bad lands out there. It was desolate. And uh, Mexico was desperate to get money at that time. So here's a, a <clears throat> next 30 years, uh, the early ranching on Santa Cruz Island uh, started. Um, this is a painting uh, by James Madison Alvin, uh, who's an artist and topographer for the US Coast Survey because the United States um, wanted to get a feel for what they had received through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So this is the first image that we know of um, the middle uh, ranch in Santa Cruz uh, Island. You see two, two structures. Now, it's, this is James Baron Shaw. It's, he, he actually uh, was hired by Castellero to manage uh, the island. And uh, 
Dr. Shaw gave up his medical practice and um, to start a, sh a ranch on the island. And he's the one that is responsible for starting a sheep ranch uh, in 1853. Bought something like 200 sheep from Santa Rosa Island, put them on Santa Cruz. And it's not known, but and there's no evidence that Cachillero ever stepped foot on uh, Santa Cruz Island. So Shaw, as fate would have it, have it uh, continued to uh, manage the island uh, for another 16 years uh, until 1869. Then William Barron, Cachillero so to San Francisco gentleman named William E. Barron, who became the second owner of the island. Um, interestingly enough, uh, uh, the following year from the purchase, uh, Barron or somebody in San Francisco advertises the island for sale and said there was only 50 sheep. Well, I don't know the representation about that, but clearly there were no uh, takers uh, to buy the island. And with the coming of the Civil War, uh, you can imagine with wool uniform, wool blankets, wool stocks, uh, the price of wool went up. And the records, the assessor records in Santa Barbara County show that uh, the number of sheep on the island uh, was 12,000. So something happened between 1858 and 1860. And, and by um, 1864, at the height of the, the Civil War, uh, there were over, 20, uh, over 24,000 uh, sheep on the island. Barron sells the island in 1869 to um, uh, 10 San Francisco area business uh, men, one of whom was my great-great-grandfather, Justinian Care. And they all had varied experiences that some were entrepreneurs. They had, uh, I think there were five different nationalities represented in this group of 10 people. Um, and they're very talented. They formed their own bank in 1860. And the first thing that uh, the owners, new owners did is um, they formed the Santa Cruz Island Company and transferred the entire island into the Santa Cruz Island Company. And in their articles of incorporation, they said the purpose of the, the company was to raise cattle. So it's obviously they didn't know what they were doing and knew nothing about the island. So, and here, uh, what they did do is spend some money uh, uh, rehabbing the island because uh, it had no war. So I believe this is the first picture uh, in late 1869 of the wharf that was built at Prisoner's Heart, but the first war. Uh, it's about 200 uh, feet long, and it was expanded over over the years. And this is um, this is their demonstration of their herd of cattle. Um, and here a similar photo in um, uh, 1869, I believe, in the uh, uh, Central Valley of the island, and. And Justinian Care, uh, I'll just say a, a few things about uh, the 1870s, because the 1870s was not good for any of the island investors, particularly Care. It wasn't good for the state of California because the bank, uh, the banks uh, were collapsing. Uh, bank of California collapsed, and uh, the French bank, uh, headed by Justinian Care. Uh, was closed. So it was a very difficult time. One historian said it uh, uh, could correctly be called the terrible 70s. Well, Justinian Care somehow managed to survive all of that. And he started buying out other shares of the Santa Cruz Island Company. So by 1880, he was a majority owner of the island. That was the year he first went to the island. And by 1886, uh, he acquired all of the shares because the other owners were two committed suicide, one went bankrupt, and it was, uh, it was a bad time for the original owners. Uh, Care was born 1827 in 
Brichon, uh, France and the French Alps. Uh, he was the youngest of uh, nine children, um, spoke several languages. Uh, as a young man, he went to Genoa and learned uh, the hardwood uh, trade. Um, here, just, Justinian is um, over here. Uh, this photograph was probably taken in the 1890s uh, as an older gentleman, and he died in 1897. But what uh, Kerr did, um, he wanted to come to California as an argonaut, and, uh, but he wasn't really interested in gold. He was interested in establishing a business in San Francisco because his thought was, I'll bring the inventory over with me and sell it for 10, 20 times uh, what I paid for it um, because that's what was happening in the San Francisco area after the discovery of uh, gold. It was highly inflationary. And so without taxes, uh, his little business uh, was a real money machine and uh, it, it would eventually became known as a Justinian uh, care company. Um, here, this is <clears throat> an invoice that gives a lot of information about the Justinian care company. The, they expanded uh, uh, their business to uh, deal with metals and uh, pruning shares and uh, when uh, uh, the vineyards became popular in California. They um, uh, provided a lot of uh, supplies for the, the different uh, vintners. And this is the building uh, that existed up until the time of the San Francisco fire and earthquake in 1906. And that building was completely demolished. Uh, but the significance of the Justinian Care Company is because it was such a cash cow, uh, that allowed him the flexibility to buy out the other owners um, uh, of Santa Cruz Island, of the Santa Cruz Island Company, and eventually um, uh, allowed him also the financial wherewithal to build uh, a significant agricultural colony uh, on the island. Now, this is uh, the Care family. 1908. This is after Justinian Kerr's death. And uh, this um, has, I think, most of the care and some of the offspring. And the Kerr family, after Justinian uh, died, um, the two married daughters uh, ended up in litigation that lasted 20 years against their siblings and their, uh, their mother. So I think the best way to understand the care era, which I uh, uh, say it goes starts at 1880, is the first phase was when during Justinian Care's lifetime, and most of the infrastructure, the height of the ranching operation, was during Justinian Care's lifetime. After he died, um, in the next 40 years, 20 years of that 40 years, was uh, enmeshed in uh, litigation. And that's probably the last family photo that they took. <laughs> now here begins 1880. So here you can see um, the, the buildings here, which uh, really uh, replicate some of the architecture of uh, French farmhouses um, in the French countryside. And compare this with what you saw on uh, uh, Alden's painting in 1855. So uh, the height of, uh, with all this building going on in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, the ranch at that time was employing about 110 uh, people. <clears throat> this is the, the warehouse, twin warehouse, that was built in 1887, made from island bricks. And this is a great photograph. You can see the, the workers and the size of the warehouse. The reason that the warehouse was, was built uh, was because uh, they wanted to be able to store the wool and gauge when the market was right to ship it to the mainland. Otherwise, otherwise they would be at the mercy of the people that were buying it on the mainland. And uh, 
the wool sacks, uh, you know, they were 400, 350 to 400 pounds each. And from 1885 to 1896, uh, the island company was producing 800 wool sacks a year. So they had a prodigious amount of wool that they were uh, making. Um, this is the chapel that was built 1891. You can see that it's uh, nestled in with uh, vineyards that are just starting to mature. Uh, it takes, you know, several years. You just don't go plant a uh, vine and expect it to, to produce. It takes, it takes a while. And the chapel is, uh, is still there, um, but the Care family learned that building a chapel doesn't prevent family squabbles. Now here's uh, a, a diagram of the, of the different uh, sub-branches uh, on the island. And that was a concept that was expanded by uh, CARE. He didn't create the concept because in uh, 1870, there was already a sub-ranch at uh, the Scorpion Ranch. And of course, in the Christie Ranch right here, uh, the first structure was built in the 1860s when uh, Barron had the property. But what Kerr did is he expanded it. And in addition to expanding it, um, he decided to uh, build a um, phone system from Scorpion to smugglers to uh, the main ranch to prisoners all the way out to Christie's. And maybe they had some other extensions. So the whole idea is the ranch... The size of the island is so big that you had to control the different operations, and, and that's what he was uh, trying to do. And here is a um, uh, nice picture of the Smuggler's House, which is still there on, at Smuggler's Cove. And again, you can see the French architect, uh, French architecture. And um, now, Bill. Running a ranch is one thing. Running a ranch on an island is another uh, complexity that most people don't even dream of. Uh, Care was getting tired of uh, botch schedules of the coast steamers. Um, you know, they'd say they'd be at Prisoner's Harbor in such a date, and they don't show up. Uh, and Care decided he was going to take things into his own hands, so he commissioned a... Uh, boat right, famous boat right up in the San Francisco named Matthew Turner, and who expanded his operation over to Benicia, and his uh, care's uh, direction to uh, uh, Turner was, make sure you build it strong. And the schooner here is uh, 64 feet long, and uh, the total weight uh, is, is substantial, 43 tons with an 18-foot uh, beam. So it was a very, very sturdy boat. And uh, my grandmother uh, was on the maiden voyage in 1893 when it went over to uh, uh, Santa Cruz. Now here, the Santa Cruz is heading into uh, uh, Santa Barbara with a load of sheep. They probably take about 250 uh, head of uh, sheep. You see back here that has San Francisco as uh, its home port. Well, the, the boat was moored in Santa Barbara, but San Francisco was where the business was uh, operated out of it. And that's the reason that uh, they have San Francisco on there. Now, the schooner Santa Cruz served the island uh, from 1893 to 1960. And in 1960, it uh, broke its moorings in, uh, in an east wind, and it uh, went on the rocks on the west portion of uh, Prisoner's Harbor. And as an old captain of the Santa Cruz described it, uh, Red uh, Crane, who operated the Santa Cruz both for the cares and the stands, he described, he says, well, she just broke uh, broke her mo uh, moorings and went on the rocks and beat herself to death. So you can just visualize uh, what was happening. It, so it was a, uh, for boat lovers, it wasn't a pretty sight. 
livestock ranching on Santa Cruz that I have 1880 to 1984 because, you know, nothing really changed as far as how you uh, uh, rounded up sheep. Here you see a posse of, of vaqueros here in, I think there's 16 overall, in Scorpion Valley. There's the old twin uh, uh, warehouse or barn. Um, and this section of the barn was a shearing set, and we stored wool on that section of the barn. Over here is the first eucalyptus grove, and that's where the first camp, that's the first campsite that you see in Scorpion Valley today. And the theory with all the riders and everything is that you would just fan out and push the sheep down to lower elevations, uh, in this instance, down to Scorpion Valley in um, uh, the middle ranch. Uh, they'd push them down uh, to the main uh, valley there. And uh, the other shearing, major shearing station was at uh, Christie. But I like this photo because if there's any hint that you want to be a sheep rancher, herding sheep, this is in the middle of the summer. It's probably between 80 and 90 degrees. And this is what the sheep do when they run. Um, and you're pretty exhausted when you're finished rounding up sheep. I can tell you that. And <clears throat> you don't want to be a, a shearer either. The, they spent probably eight hours a day sharing. It's back-breaking work. And uh, you can see right here that he's using hand clippers. So they would probably uh, shear about 70 animals per shear uh, in a day. Uh, on the Greeny Ranch, uh, we started using electric shears in 1939. And a, a good shear with, with electric shears could uh, uh, clip uh, about a hundred animals. Uh, and this, I can't even imagine what their backs feel like, uh, at the end of eight hours. And this is what, uh, is a result of all that shearing. And these are the, uh, wool sacks I was talking about that are either were stored in, uh, the warehouse waiting for good market condition. Uh, and they're being loaded and, you know, the, these are cumbersome uh, sacks. And uh, when I was growing up, my dad thought it'd be a good idea getting ready for high school football that uh, I uh, sack a lot of wool. And I then began to think, you know, maybe I'd better think about uh, a law career because, <laughs> because it is, when you get in there and you literally, you can't get out except in the throw fleeces at you and you just keep stomping on the fleece until you you come you finally your head pops out at the top and then you tie it off and you always whoops you always want those little knots because they help uh, turn the sacks 1884 uh, Kerr decided that he wanted to experiment uh, uh, with vineyards that was a kind of the practice in California and and the uh, most acreage that was developed uh, was between 175 and 200 acres. Uh, and in a fully mature vine, they could produce, one acre could produce anywhere from 450 to 600 gallons uh, per acre. So the height, uh, the height of uh, the wine production in Santa Cruz Island was, uh, I believe, 1910. Uh, when they produced 83,000 gallons. So it wasn't, it was probably one of the largest uh, uh, wine operations in Santa Barbara County at the time. They were growing primarily Zinfandel because that was a hearty uh, uh, grape. And it, bear in mind that the, there was no irrigation system. This is dry farming. And uh, a lot of uh, backbreaking work. Um, and so by, <clears throat> because the, the, the vines were taking and it was successful, um, the Santa Cruz Island Company decided to build uh, uh, the winery on the side of the hill. And here's the fermenting and crushing uh, building. They would bring uh, the cuttings there, uh, put them in boxes and put the boxes on the truck uh, or wagon, uh, take it up 
dump it into the crusher, and then the juices would flow in the fermenting tanks, and the fermenting tanks could hold about 42,000 gallons. And then after a couple months, uh, uh, the wine juices would drain down into the cellar here, and they had all kinds of different, I think there were four different uh, wine uh, containers uh, that could hold 11,000 gallons of, uh, each. And the total capacity of the winery, the cooperage, uh, was uh, about 176,000 uh, gallons. So they could hold a couple seasons uh, of wine, but they had to move it. Uh, here's a wine label that um, uh, was designed by Arthur Kerr. Um, it's very artistic, uh, but it was probably rarely used because uh, Santa Cruz wasn't producing uh, wine uh, by the bottle. Uh, if you ever find one with a label and wine in it, uh, you might uh, it might be worth something. But they were uh, they were shipping in bulk, uh, 50, 50 gallon containers. Uh, that you see here, they're loading them onto the Santa Cruz, and and then they would ship them either to uh, Santa Barbara, uh, San Francisco, or um, Los Angeles. Here you can see they had a wine depot in uh, Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz Island Wine Depot, <clears throat> and so that's where uh, they ship primarily in bulk. Now, of course, you can imagine what uh, effect uh, prohibition had on the wine industry on Santa Cruz Island. That pretty much uh, destroyed it, took the heart out of it, but they still sold uh, the grapes. So they contracted with uh, uh, gentlemen Maratti and Georgie uh, that agreed to uh, pay the workers to pick it and put them in the boxes. and shipping on the Santa Cruz over to um, uh, the mainland, principally Santa Barbara. And uh, you know, during uh, Prohibition, anything, the, the most alcohol that you could have was a half a percent. Anything more was illegal. Well, the Italians in Santa Barbara didn't do their math right, so they just made it whatever wine they, they wanted. And uh, so that... So it wasn't just fruit juice that they were making in Santa Barbara during Prohibition. Uh, but after Prohibition, um, you can see uh, they were actually selling Santa Cruz Island uh, uh, wine and with the Appalachian here. And you can tell it's after Prohibition because it's got the 14% by uh, volume. But that's a, a very good looking label. And this is a picture of, again, by Tim Hoff, uh, looking west on the island. And you can see how rugged it is. It's, uh, it's a massive piece of real estate. Uh, and like I said, during that uh, 20 years of litigation, it's unheard of, but uh, six cases went up to the California Supreme Court on the island alone. The end part of all of that litigation is the court in Santa Barbara said, uh, this place, we need to appoint referees uh, to survey uh, the island. And that took place, uh, 1923 time frame. It took uh, probably uh, 237 days, I think, uh, and uh, cost 37,000, which today is about a half a million. So it was a very extensive uh, survey. And here you see what looks like a gargoyle, wondering what the heck is going on. And, and the result of all of this, uh, and they literally measured, tried to measure every foot of the island. And this is the result of all that partition uh, surveying. And the island was divided into seven parcels. And each parcel uh, size would depend on how many shares you own in the Santa Cruz Island Company. Uh, the two married daughters uh, had the smallest share. Um, they were here, parcel six and parcel seven. 
and the referees thought that this family has been at it for 20 years, so we're going to put the married daughters over here and separated by uh, uh, have the Montagnon, which is 1,800 feet high and had no road to the other side. They felt that the Montagnon would be a good barrier between them and the rest of uh, their family. Now, the rest of the family, the rest of the care family sold in uh, uh, their area of the, uh, island, which is about 90% of it, to uh, Ed Stanton in 1937. Uh, the National Park Service acquired the East End uh, um, after in the 1990s. And then um, when, when Terry Stanton died, or go back there, when Terry Stanton died uh, in 1987, um, all of this ownership here went to the Nature Conservancy. And then the Park Service and the Nature Conservancy got together. And so this is the current boundary between uh, the two entities, the Park Service owning about a quarter and um, the Nature Conservancy owning uh, the other. And of course, the Nature Conservancy is dedicated to preserving uh, the island just as the park is. <clears throat> the partition uh, spawned two new uh, ranching uh, generations. Uh, here you see uh, 1934. Uh, uh, passport photo of, of the Stanton family. Here's young Carrie here, Ed Stanton, his wife Evelyn, and Ed Jr. Now, Ed Jr. was really destined to uh, take over uh, the island because Carrie was a more academic uh, kind, and Carrie went on to medical school and became a doctor. Uh, Ed Stanton, I love this photo of Ed. He's not drinking lemonade, I can tell you that. He was an oil man from Los Angeles, very successful businessman. And he, um, uh, he loved the island. He tried his hand at sheep ranching. Um, the sheep didn't do what he expected them to do. They broke loose and uh, <clears throat> went with their wild brethren in the here hills, and so he gave up that and then started either killing or shipping uh, sheep off. He wanted nothing to do with uh, sheep. He settled on a small cattle operation, <clears throat> uh, pretty much the size that the cares uh, had. He had no taste for the wine business, uh, so he arranged with the federal government to uh, shut down uh, the winery, and he did this in... 1930, 39 federal agents. Now you have to have a federal agent there making sure that you're uh, decommissioning your sellers and uh, under the watchful eye of the federal agent. And to the dismay of a lot of the workers, they opened the spigots and drained 25,000 gallons onto the road. And the pigs were loving it. <laughs> This is, uh, this is Ed Jr. right here. He's a strapping guy, 220, loved women, didn't like studying. Um, he joined, uh, like a lot of young men, World War II. His unit uh, landed on D-Day, which we just honored the other day, at Utah Beach. Their objective was to move on to Sherbon. And um, the end of June, he... Um, received a letter from his wife that she just gave uh, birth to uh, a son. He was elated. And two weeks later, uh, his unit under, uh, came under fire from the Germans, and he was killed in a motor attack. So here's his younger brother, uh, Kerry. I knew Kerry personally. Uh, got along with him. But uh, you just had to be careful which buttons you pushed. And um, he was very passionate about uh, preserving the island. Now, he becomes the second doctor to give up his medical practice uh, to manage the island. His parents were getting ill, so in 1957, he took over the operation of the island and uh, managed it for um, uh, 30 years. And he said it was the best decision he ever made in his, his life. And he says, you cannot compare the 
air of Santa Cruz Island with any place else. Of course, he lived in Los Angeles. Uh, so, he, so he knew that the pristine air of Santa Cruz was a welcome. But Terry at times could be very difficult uh, to get along with. He didn't get along with Ed the uh, Third, uh, his brother's uh, son, and um, they ended up in a lawsuit. Um, and again, it was very much like the care litigation, except uh, uh, Terry and uh, Ed the Third were smart enough to say, you know what, we're not going to spend 20 years in litigation like the the care. So they settled, and the impetus for settling was that they were able to bring Nature Conservancy in to fund the settlement. And but no sooner than the ink was dry on that uh, agreement, and that Kerry got in dispute with uh, the Nature Conservancy um, because over the Hunt Club, because Nature Conservancy wanted to eliminate the sheep uh, because you know they wanted to conserve uh, the island and the sheep were a valuable entity because they uh, the Hunt Club generated uh, substantial money. So anyway, uh, this is the context of the quote. I just do not want to be pushed around. Let me alone and let me care for Santa Cruz Island. And that's how he died. He uh, wanted absolute control over who went over the island. And if you, invite, if you were invited over by Kerry Stanton, you damn well better have sent him a thank you note within two weeks or you were never invited back. I was always saying thank you to Kerry. Now, the, the other family error, of course, is my family, the Guarini family. We took over, um, or my grandfather took over uh, in 1926, um, <clears throat> the end of the partition case. Uh, it's clear that the, the Guarinis had no boat, they had no communication, they had no pier, and they had no clue what they were doing ranching on an island, much less sheep ranch. So they figured it out, or at least my uh, grandfather did. And because it was, my, my dad said, well, this is kind of romantic uh, to have an island and work. Well, uh, his father disabused him of uh, the notion that this is going to be fun um, because my dad actually took a year off of law school and spent a year on the island. Um, and that uh, was passed down to my generation. Um, this is an interesting photo because this was uh, the first pier that uh, the Greenies uh, made. This was in early 1930s, a very uh, ramshackle uh, pier. Um, and this is the current location of where the Park Service wants to put their, their new pier. So it's a historically in the right location. This uh, little shack up there was uh, fishing. Uh, camps that were uh, situated along the around the east end. They were owned by the Larco Fish Company in Santa Barbara, <clears throat> and the Greenies had this deal with the Larco Fish Company that if we'll let you use your fish camps on the island if you let uh, us uh, uh, transport some goods and people uh, to and from the island on your boats. And so that was an arrangement that worked until uh, the Greenies built their own pier and got their own uh, boat. I talked about the island being uh, is about uh, people. And here is uh, Joe Griggs. He's kind of one of, uh, I, I like Joe Griggs because I didn't know him well because uh, he left the island in 1956. He came from Oklahoma, had very little education, uh, formal education, uh, couldn't write but he read popular mechanics. He loved, he could, as my father said, he could do, do almost anything but write. And, but he, was, he showed the kind of ingenuity that island owners uh, showed over years and years is uh, because you have to figure things out. You have to do it with the supplies you have on hand. And so he persuaded my dad to build this sawmill up in the first campground now, where the Park Service has their first campground. And he, Joe saw the eucalyptus and says, oh, that's a lot of lumber and everything. So he builds this elaborate sawmill. And my dad was, I don't know, maybe he was covering his track. He says, the fact we didn't need a mill in no way detracted from the ingenuity and skill 
that went to its making. Well, my father didn't realize also that uh, when eucalyptus dries, it's, it's useless. It's you know, lumber. It's, it hardens it, it twists. So they couldn't use it on the wharf uh, at all. So the uh, mill was eventually dismantled. <clears throat> Here is the, the Hodge. Uh, the Hodge is, uh, uh, was our second boat. It was built in 1943 uh, and built by the Army. It was one of their T boats, as they call them. It was built uh, for tra or transportation of equipment in the Aleutian Island. It uh, was a wonderful ranch boat. Uh, its only uh, drawback, it was painfully slow. And going from Santa Cruz to Scorpion across that angle, you're in a uh, beam uh, wave, and so it's it's very difficult. Uh, I mean, you're rocking and rolling, and um, so unfortunately, I was on this sucker in January of 1976. We were leaving uh, Santa Barbara Harbor, which is maybe you uh, might know is during the winter time it silts up. So that the entrance to the harbor is very narrow. And uh, we hit the, the sandbar, or scraped the sandbar, pulled back off. And we had a light load. We had 15, 55 gallon drums of gasoline and kerosene that we were taking to the island. So about three miles out, and my uncle said, came to me and he says, something's wrong with the engine. He went down to check, and he pops right back up and he says, we're sinking. And he said, uh, I don't think I like this. Um, so I got everybody into life preservers. And then I went to open the front cargo hatch, which is about 10 feet deep. And you could put, I don't know, 20, 25 of those big wool sacks in there. And when I opened it up, um, it was half full of water. And I never learned to swim. And I figured this might be my first swim lesson in Santa Barbara Channel. So. I was a little apprehensive until I saw the Coast Guard uh, on the horizon, uh, the Point Judith, uh, plowing the 22 knots uh, to the scene of the sinking. That was the prettiest sight that I can remember. And you can just vision the, the vessel like the Island Range. It's a little bit smaller, but it's the uh, same idea with the bow going up, crashing down. I mean, it was, it was a powerful uh, 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 boat and when I got off the water was deck level and for some reason uh, the captain wanted to tow the hides back to Santa Barbara I don't know maybe it was my uncle that said that or, or asked for that but the uh, Point Judith had two twin uh, twin uh, engines each capable of 800 uh, horsepower and it tethered to the hides and it was trying to pull it and all of a sudden, you heard the captain bark out like I could hear it like it was yesterday, uh, cut her loose. And so the hides mercifully uh, slipped between the waves, a uh, little bit more uh, dignity than the way the Santa Cruz uh, beat herself on the rocks. The next year, <clears throat> uh, we were back in operation using the Vaquero, which is uh, 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 built um, by Linwall Boatworks in Santa Barbara and uh, for the Santa Cruz, I mean, for the Vail Vickers Company of uh, Santa Rosa. It was, it was a beautifully built uh, vessel uh, specifically to haul uh, livestock. So we could haul about 550 to 600 sheep. Um, now, one of my duties on this thing, uh, mind you, I'm, I'm now practicing law. But one of my duties was to be a deckhand when we were taking the sheep to Port Wainimi. And you go around with, uh, on the deck while it's underway. <clears throat> if the sheep gets on its knees, you pull it up so it doesn't suffocate. Or if it gets on the gunnels, you pull it back down so it doesn't jump over. And by the time you get to Wainimi, uh, you're soaked in urine and everything else that comes out of the sheep. And I think we would have qualified for uh, Mike Rowe's uh, Dirty Jobs, his TV series. Anyway, uh, here he is. Uh, this is the second to the last chapter. This is on um, uh, the preservation of, of the island. And 
here there's about 600 plants known on Santa Cruz Island. This is a silver lotus. It's only known to exist on Santa Cruz Island. And here's the scrub jay, uh, one of about 140 different birds on Santa Cruz Island. And it too is uh, only known to exist on Santa Cruz Island. Now, we grew up, uh, and I'm sure my father grew up, everything on the island depended on the weather. I can, I can remember my father repeating it a million times when you ask a question, when are we going, et cetera, et cetera. It's weather permitting. Well, weather permitting is uh, just simply means that weather dominates what you do on the island. This was, um, uh, this was in December uh, 1997 when an El Nino storm hit the east end of the island. It was about 14 inches of rain that hit uh, 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 the east end of the island in a 48-hour 48, uh, 48 period of time, and it just devastated. We lost a lot of historic equipment, and, uh, including the old blacksmith shop, and it was really sad. And here, at the next day following the storm, and here you can see the bunkhouse almost floated out to sea. That the historic bunkhouse, uh, they got caught up in a tree. And uh, so between 2005 and 2009, the Park Service uh, got the property ready for uh, public use. And this is kind of the highlight. Uh, the uh, Island Museum was open in uh, uh, 2009, and one of my favorite exhibits in there is the video uh, demonstra uh, the video of my that my grandmother took, 16 millimeter camera in the 1940s and 50s of the shearing operation. So it's the only known uh, video and only known movie of uh, uh, the shearing operation. You can see that on the Park Service website on their multimedia. So it's. It's about 10 minutes, so when you, if you ever get out to Scorpion, go in, in the kitchen and uh, take a look at it. And here's the old, <clears throat> the island fox that everybody loves, and um, the eagles, golden eagles, were eat, eating the fox to extinction. And uh, that is the culprit. Uh, he belongs in the post office. Um, they were going after the piglets, and they just added uh, the fox because they're similar size uh, to their diet. And of course, the pigs were rooting and destroying archaeological sites and causing erosion. So the Park Service and uh, Nature Conservancy got together. Um, they live captured what remaining uh, fox there were. They're less than uh, around maybe it's 50, uh, but out of a beginning number of 1,000. Uh, the fox population was just decimated, put on the endangered species list. Uh, they then fenced off uh, the entire island of Santa Cruz into five zones and systematically eliminated the pigs in each zone. Uh, they live captured the golden eagles and brought them to the mainland and reintroduced bald eagles to the island, uh, which bald eagles uh, don't really like uh, uh, piglets and fox, uh, they go after the uh, fish. And then um, uh, when everything was working, they released uh, the fox from captivity. And the fox are now thriving today, so much so that they've been taken off the endangered species there. And here, as an early photograph of uh, island workers uh, filling in uh, um, the wetlands in Prisoner's Harbor for ranch uses, and the Park Service and the Nature Conservancy got together to reestablish the wetlands of Santa Cruz Island. Um, and it's one of the uh, few wetlands uh, remaining. And um, they removed, I think it was something like uh, 10,000 cubic yards of soil and another thousand trees of eucalyptus and relocated the corrals and got rid of the uh, Kukuya and the fennel. Um, so anyway, the sights and sounds that you haven't heard for years are now returned to the Prisoner's Harbor wetland. This is the last uh, chapter, and um, I was telling, well, how, 
how do I end this book because it was growing by leaps and bounds. And I saw this picture and some, a number like it. I said, you know, this has to bring the island story uh, about people enjoying the island. And this photograph was taken in 1897. And um, you can notice the dress, you know, they're, uh, they're just hanging out. And look at this lady right here. Um, she's pretty serious. And I don't know what she's shooting. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it was the reason I had this uh, chapter, because there's a lot of people, uh, even when it was under private ownership, that got to enjoy uh, the island. This was, of course, the Eaton's uh, Pelican Bay camp. They had an arrangement with the Santa Cruz Island Company. Um, and the reason the uh, company liked it is, one, they got revenue, and two, uh, it presided, uh, gave a presence uh, on the islands, so, uh, people wouldn't be trespassing, and so on and so forth. So um, you can see it started out with tents, and then they uh, ended up building a little cabin, and then the main dining room. And literally, you know, uh, the rich and the famous were coming from everywhere uh, to Santa Cruz Island to enjoy that. And uh, the time the Eatons had it, um, there were, I believe, something like 27 different movies that were produced on the island. And this lasted until the early uh, 1930s. And the Eatons uh, had their own boat, the Sea Wolf, which uh, brought people from particularly Santa Barbara out uh, for the day or whatever stay they arranged. So it wasn't just the rich and famous in yachts that could come out. The, the Sea Wolf, unfortunately, uh, met a similar fate like the schooner Santa Cruz, broke its mooring in a southeast storm and went on the beach. Um, this is what you'll see at Santa Cruz Island. Uh, now you, you see the kayakers enjoying the, the sea cave. Um, and I like this quote because it really epitomizes um, uh, the National Park uh, legacy, the best idea we've ever had, absolutely American, absolutely democratic. They reflect us at our best rather than our worst. And uh, there are about 400 uh, units on the national, that the National Park manages from uh, battlefield to monuments to there's 59 now national parks. And Last year alone, 320 million people visited these different things, which is a testament that really the national uh, or national park system is uh, everybody's uh, park and really an American uh, legacy. Uh, the last slide is um, a favorite hiking spot for um, people that go to the east end of the island. This is Potato Harbor. Um, don't ask me how it got its name. I just assume it looked like a potato. Um, so anyway, uh, there's my contact information. If you had, uh, want to email me or whatever. My daughter, because she thinks I'm pretty dumb with electronics, actually uh, uh, created a website. And uh, so he says, Dad, you've got to be able to have people go on Amazon. I said, well, what's Amazon? <laughs> so, anyway, she took care of it. So you can Google that, those of you know how to Google. Um, but anyway, that's uh, the end of the presentation. I hope that gives you some feel of the rich history of uh, Santa Cruz Island. Thank you, John, for sharing your wealth of knowledge about Santa Cruz Island. We have time for a couple questions. Uh, I anchored in Fry's Harbor Cove on the northwest side, and there were some uh, rail tracks in that little cove. Would you happen to know what they were doing there? Uh, they were 
excavating for rock, uh, quarried rock for Santa Barbara Harbor in the 19, late 20s, early 1930s. So that's where you go into Santa Barbara breakwater. That's where the rock came from, Santa Cruz. <clears throat> So what do you think about the Scorpion Pier going like right in the middle of the riverway like it was in the past? Oh, I'm not going to enter into political discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I mean, like uh, you saw in the, uh, the film, it's historically uh, correct. Um, uh, initially, um, you know, my father built uh, that cement pier um, the only problem is, one, um, uh, he wasn't an engineer, and he probably should have got an engineer because they built it too too low. And then when the Park Service took over, they actually raised it up. But And uh, even raising it up, uh, it still got uh, uh, damaged. So anyway, I, I leave that to the people that are a lot smarter than me. Do you have any knowledge of the research station that was established and its history on the island? Well, the um, Harry Stanton's, um, uh, I mean, the uh, <coughs> University of California. Right. Yeah, Harry Stanton worked a, uh, had an agreement with the uh, University of California, and that was the origin uh, of that. And I think it's expanded uh, since that time. That started, I believe, in the 1960s. We've uh, found the remains of, I think it was an oil well. Did they ever actually get any oil? No. No? It was just an, uh, an attempt. Thanks. It was an attempt. <laughs> yeah, they, there was actually a couple uh, efforts on the east end uh, where they drilled for oil. Um, and it wasn't just the east end. During the care era, they uh, had, I think, three different attempts to uh, drill for oil. They never found anything. Uh, do you know if anybody's tried to build a beer over at Smugglers? Uh, smugglers, um, no, uh, they didn't, and because uh, the wave action is um, too difficult, and it, it's been looked at, and it was looked at uh, when our family uh, devised a master plan in the 1960s, and uh, if you notice, it's it's shallow, and the waves come in, and, and they just crack cracked down and it would not be, they should just say, this is not a good place for a pier. There used to be a hunting camp there at, uh, at Smugglers. Is that history in the, in the book? Uh, not so much other than to mention it, but certainly in uh, my first book um, that was published in 1997. Um, yeah, there was a hunting plant, Island Adventures. It's, you know, uh, uh, more, it was established in the 1980s, and uh, actually it was the first person to establish a hunting camp as such I, uh, was Dr. Terry Stanton on uh, the other end of the island, again in the 1960s. Uh, it was before my time visiting Santa Cruz, but I heard uh, over at Valleys on the south side, there used to be a Navy base and a submarine would surface right near the island. Um, I don't know much about that. Um, I, I know that, uh, you know, on the back side of uh, Santa Cruz, they call it the Santa Cruz Island or the Santa Cruz uh, Basin or Canyon, uh, the depths of the island, the uh, depths of the water in that area are about 6,400 feet. And during the 1960s, for about 30 years, the Navy was doing acoustical testing of um, anything from ships to submarines. So I, I don't know whether it's related, but there certainly was scientific uh, uh, 
studies going on by the United States government. We have time for one more question. Um, thank you for coming and doing this for us. This is a sense of history. I have a question about the twin uh, warehouse. Yes. The doors were very fascinating. They were twice as tall as the men. And the way they opened were from the middle, they looked like they went mm -hmm. sideways. Can you why they were so big, so tall? I imagine, well, a couple things. Uh, one, I don't know whether the, what you see on the slide is distorted, and it could be. But still, they, I mean, you see it in person. They were big because you see those big wool sacks? And so they wanted to be able to uh, bring the wool sacks into uh, 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 the warehouse there and store them. So um, well, actually, they, they had a rail system um, whereby they could um, uh, put them on a little carriage on, you know, tracks and you, you push it uh, onto the pier from uh, the warehouse. So it was pretty in ingenious. Uh, uh, but I don't know about the doors. I can't answer that. Thank you once again to John for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Have a safe drive home. <laughs>